So we're here with uh, Terry Evanswood over at Wonderworks. Abracadabra. And, and he is the local magician. Yeah, in case you hadn't guessed, <laughs> it's magic time. <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit about your show. Um, what are some of the things that are uh, involved? Well, the magic show is kind of a little combination of every type of magic. Some magicians specialize in sleight of hand magic. Some do stage illusions, some comedy or audience participation. Some magicians only do mind reading tricks. The purpose of our show is really a family-oriented show that involves all the above. So we get people involved in the show, there's comedy, there's drama, very serious moments. We even do a Harry Houdini tribute where I have to escape from this 25-inch oh, buzzsaw. That's so cool. that's awesome. And uh, yeah, that's always fun. Actually, it didn't work one time. I oh. mean, my part didn't work. I didn't get out. Oh. Uh, I ended up in Sevier County Emergency Room with 30 stitches in my right leg, no joke. So that's one of those oh moments, like a lot of moments in a magic show where you don't know exactly how things are going to go. Mm. Just different from some of the music shows, all the shows in Pigeon Forge are fantastic. Uh, but if a dancer misses a step, the show goes on. Yeah. If I miss a cue... You lose a foot. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. That's so crazy. So how did you get into magic? Like, where did it all begin? Well, I had always had an interest in show business and originally thought I was going to be an actor of some sort. And ironically... Harry Houdini's idol, Robert Houdin, which was a French magician, he had a very famous quote that I apply in my show. A magician is an actor playing the part of a miracle worker, right? Wow. I have to believe what I'm doing to make it come across the footlights. So I am an actor, but magic is the vehicle, the mode of entertainment. My dad took me to see a great magician when I was nine years old, Harry Blackstone Jr. And um, he sawed his wife in half and flowed people in the air and made rabbits appear and disappear. I was nine years old, and you know, like when you were nine, you knew everything. Mm -hmm. oh, you course, think you know everything. <laughs> so I knew everything. I was gonna know how everything was done. And I sat there with my mouth open, just in awe of what I was seeing. Oh, wow. And I knew in that moment that I wanted to be the guy up there making other people feel the way I felt watching my first magic show. So it really was a moment that defined my life. My parents had taken me to Disney World and Ringling Brothers Circus and all kinds of wonderful things. But when I saw the magic show, that was it. Changed my life. And I've never stopped. This is all I've ever done since I was nine years old. That That's incredible. So cool. yeah. I love that. I came here to Pigeon Forge on a six month contract. That, that was all I was guaranteed, six months. That was 22 years ago, <laughs> last wow. week. We're now proud to say we're the, the longest running headline show in the history of Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. I've performed as of this week 6,543 shows will be tonight's show. I really believe that we can't have an appreciation and respect for where we are if we don't first have an appreciation and respect for the past. Absolutely. And as a magician, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, names like Thurston, Blackstone, Houdini. So having an appreciation for history, I started collecting magic memorabilia, things that belong to magicians, my heroes from the past. So the collection has grown a little out of control. There are thousands of items in here that I collected one by one. Uh, the collection, the Hall of Magic, is available all day long. It's a free exhibit here at Wonderworks. So stop by for any, uh, any opportunity that you have to check out the Magic Museum. And you have to visit Wonderworks and the Magic Show any night you'd like. So let me take you through and tell you about some of the amazing stories of some of my heroes. So when my dad took me to see Blackstone the Magician when I was nine years old, after the show, Blackstone came out to visit with the kids, as I do now, uh, kind of a meet and greet to say hello to everybody in person. And the end of Blackstone's show was a circus theme. So he wore this beautiful uh, rhinestone circus ringmaster costume that was designed by Bob Mackey, a very famous costume designer in Hollywood. And uh, this is it. This is the uh, original costume that Blackstone was wearing the day I saw my first magic show and I met him. So as I stand here, I can remember standing next to him, my heart pounding, knowing I want to be you one day. <laughs> and uh, when he passed away, unfortunately, I had the chance to work with him several times, but when he passed away, his wife wanted me to have the costume that he wore the day I fell in love with magic. Oh, That's incredible. That's amazing. My collection was inspired by a place called the American Museum of Magic in Marshall, Michigan. The guy who's the curator and owner of it, Bob Lund, became a very good friend of mine. And at one point I was admiring his statues of magicians. And he had about 22 of them. And he, I had several of them already. And he challenged me to find all 22. Well, I, I found 264 <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I'm a little overachiever. I, and, uh, and now fans of the show, knowing that I collect magic 
statuary bring me gifts often during the show. So some of these remind me of specific people that I've been blessed to know or meet along the way. Well, I love photography of magic because it really captures a moment in history, and I love the magicians of the past. So a lot of these are autographed pictures of magicians that I've met, known, or worked with over the years. And, uh, and one little surprise that some people don't catch, most people don't catch, but this one should look familiar right here. Is that, is that you? That's you. Terry Evans Wood at yes! 20 years old. <laughs> So That's awesome. three years ago. But not to insult anyone else on this list, but do you have a favorite that you've worked with out of all these? Um, mm. Actually, my this guy here, Ralph Beck, was my magic teacher. He was the grandnephew of the world's greatest magician, Howard Thurston. And uh, he took a liking to me, and we were lifelong friends. He and his wife, Connie, uh, he gave me all of his paraphernalia I have in my collection at my home, the sleight of hand tricks he taught me over the years. When my friend Ralph Beck, who was my mentor, passed away, I performed at his funeral what we call the Broken Wand Ceremony. It's a tradition that magicians have, not unlike when a, vet, a veteran dies, uh, they'll fold the flag and present it to the widow mm -hmm. uh, as a memory of his service. Magicians have the same tradition with the magic wand. When a magician passes away, his wand is broke over the grave to signify the end of his Aww. reign of magic on this plane. And um, the Society of American Magicians, once you've been involved uh, long enough, you're presented with a wand. So this is my wand, Terry oh, Evanswood. Cool. And uh, one day that will be broken in memory of my magic while I was here. Oh, that's amazing. That's such a beautiful sentiment. I that like it. That is so cool. This is very special. It was one of the greatest honors that I received from my uh, magic peers. It's uh, referred to as the Merlin Award. It's the equivalent to the Oscar in the world of magic. Nice. And every year, a magician somewhere around the world receives one. Uh, David Copperfield, Harry Blackstone Jr., before he passed, uh, Siegfried and Roy, Doug Henning, Chris Angel, all the great magicians. And I'm pretty honored to be on that list of recipients of the Merlin Award. Uh, it's presented by the International Magician Society, and they have 25,000 members worldwide. So they showed up here as a surprise, and uh, one night the show stopped, and the president came up and presented me with the Merlin Award. That's amazing. That's incredible. It's, Were you it's excited? Pretty, oh my gosh. I was <laughs> speechless. I bet. That is so awesome. Makes me uh, very happy. <laughs> Makes me feel like it's all worthwhile. When you get recognition from your peers, there is no better compliment. Oh, yeah. Because they know what goes on to create a show. The costuming, lighting, choreography, script, special effects, the illusions, the rehearsal, all the things that go into the show. Um, so, meant a lot to me. We're going to skip down here. Is that seriously real liquid in there? <laughs> That's a Houdini beer <laughs> that they uh, made in Appleton, his hometown. That is so That's cool. That's awesome. Houdini, of course, being one of the greatest names in magic, and ironically, was not really a magician. He was, uh, of course, a great escape artist, mm -hmm. but it was hard to keep audiences entertained for two hours of watch me get out of these ropes, watch me get out of these handcuffs, watch me get out of the straitjacket, which mm -hmm. we do in the show, I escape from the straitjacket in the show. Um, so Houdini learned magic for the first half of his show. He did standard magic tricks. The second half was all his escape work. Wow. So there's a key that belonged to Houdini that was used for one of his great escapes, uh, handcuffs that were his, autographs of Houdini, which are very rare and hard to find. And uh, one of the favorite items I have in the Houdini collection is a souvenir program book from uh, the year he died in 1926. It was a week before Halloween, and Houdini was punched in the stomach his appendix ruptured and peritonitis set in. It's the poisons that run through your system. The doctors gave him 24 hours to live because he did the show instead of going to the hospital. Oh, man. Uh, the night he was supposed to go to the hospital, he didn't. He got on a train and went to Detroit from Montreal, Canada, because he had a show the next night. And as all great showmen say, the, world, the show the must show go on. Gone. And he should have gone to the hospital. By the time he arrived in Detroit, he was in such excruciating pain, they rushed him to Grace Memorial Hospital, where he died. Uh, exactly a week later, and this is the most amazing part, doctors gave him 24 hours to live. He's a very stubborn man. You can't be Houdini without being, being stubborn. stubborn. <laughs> uh, it was a week before Halloween, and he wanted one last headline. He held out for a week and died on Halloween, oh so the newspapers gosh. could say, Harry Houdini dies on Halloween. How cool would that sound? These original newspaper articles 
counting down Houdini's hours, his temperature and his spirits and the condition of his wife emotionally. Wow. Um, just amazing story. This is a complete collection of A.C. Gilbert's Misto Magic sets. A.C. Gilbert was a toy manufacturer back in the 20s and the 30s. He is the first guy who created uh, chemistry sets, uh, erector sets, which was like Legos of the metal Legos of their time, and magic cool. sets. He thought it was a great idea, as it was, to put a bunch of toys in one box. Kids would have fun with that, like their own little toy box. So yeah. that's when sets of things were created, the first mass-produced magic set. So there's no plastic, which is really cool. Of course, everything was metal, hand-carved wood, uh, cardboard elements. Every magic set included its own poster. So like, for example, here, you could put your name up at the top, like Wilbur Curtis did, and it even came little tickets. You could pass out the tickets to your neighbor friends to come to your magic show. Oh, and the coolest so part, you know, the magicians back then, the typical magicians of the, the turn of the century had a little handlebar mustache. Mm -hmm. The sets came with little glue-on oh. mustaches. So you'd have your mustache, your tickets, your poster. I love that. And oh, that's uh, wonderful. Your, your friends would come see the magic show. That the rarest so item cool. I have in the whole collection is this uh, little Misto Magic set. It's the only one known ex in existence. It was filmed and uh, photographed for the, the book, the really complete story of A.C. Gilbert. Um, it is a salesman sample Misto Magic set, and I found it at a flea market probably 15 years ago for 50 cents. No way. Yeah, what? David Copperfield wants it. There's been a lot of offers from magicians, but I won't sell it. It's just a really cool story. Okay. But the coolest story of these books, I had, there's three Gilbert Magic books, one on handkerchief tricks, one on coin tricks, and one on rope tricks. I had the, the books on uh, ropes and coins. So a magician friend of mine, uh, B.J. Harris from Nashville, was here to see the collection. And he said, you're missing one of the books. And I didn't know there was another one. He said, yeah, no, I have one. I'll send it to you. So he left and went to Nashville. I'm not making this stuff up. The next night, I came in, and there was a book on my dressing room counter, the missing book, handkerchief book. And I thought, now this guy is magic. How did he get How to Nashville, get the book, and get it back here overnight? It's impossible. I opened the book, and there was a note that said, Terry, I found this in my parents' attic and thought you might enjoy it to add to your collection, Bobby. Bobby was my spotlight guy for 10 years. Oh. I mean, he had literally found it the same day the same that I heard day. about it. It just, magic. That is so cool. That is a wild story. Uh -huh. So the next part of the collection is what we call pocket tricks. Uh, these were tricks that kids could find in a dime store or a novelty shop. And they were typically easy to do tricks, like little card tricks or tricks making things appear and disappear that didn't take a lot of skill, but often inspired kids to become interested or fall in love with magic. Then they'd move on to a magic set like one of the Gilbert sets, and then the rest is history. And it's funny, most kids, especially boys, go through a stage with magic, and some people it just sticks with. I got my first magic set for Christmas when I was eight years old and I loved it so much. That's why my dad took me to see Blackstone, thank goodness. Blackstone Jr., the magician I saw, his father was a magician before him. And uh, probably my favorite magician from the past, from what I've read, there isn't a lot of film footage of Blackstone Sr., but he was incredible and such a nice uh, guy from all the accounts that I've heard. Uh, in this collection is a bow tie that belonged to Blackstone, photographed there. Um, a uh, a handkerchief that uh, came to life in his hands. He'd borrow a handkerchief from a member of the audience that would dance like a ghost. We actually do that as a tribute to him in our show every night. But the coolest story about Blackstone is this brick from uh, the Lincoln Theater, September 2nd, 1942, that was in Decatur, Illinois. Now this is long before you know, television was popular, there was, uh, there was no internet. So if a show came to town, much like a circus, people would flock to the show. So it was uh, September 2nd, the Decatur Theater was full, almost 2,200 people, a lot of kids. In the middle of the show, Blackstone's stage manager walked out, tapped him on the shoulder and said, Mr. Blackstone, the theater's on fire. He said, I hope you're kidding. He said, I, w I wouldn't kid. Blackstone didn't miss a, a beat. He stepped to the edge of the stage, stopped the orchestra. They carried live orchestra back in those days. Stopped the orchestra and this is exactly what he said. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my next illusion is so great, so grand, no theater in America can house it. 
so it'll be performed out in the center court of this fine city. If everyone will walk out in an orderly fashion, you'll see the biggest disappearing act you've ever witnessed. And he said, if any of you kids are pushing or shoving, you will have to stay in the theater and you will not see the trick. So everyone exit the closest exits in an orderly fashion and you will see the greatest disappearing act in history. Oh, how clever is that? That is super clever. So That's everyone awesome. got out quietly, the theater burned, Blackstone's team got all his equipment out the back door. The only fatality was the next morning, Blackstone's stage manager, who tipped him off on what was happening, didn't show up for the train to leave in the next town. He had suffered a heart attack in the hotel and died oh. that morning from the stress of trying to save Blackstone's show. Uh, but that was the day Blackstone the magician, in my opinion, became Blackstone the hero. Yeah, cool. definitely. Absolutely. It was the 1950s when Tony Curtis starred in a beautiful film titled Houdini, where he played the lead role uh, opposite of Janet Lee, who played Mrs. Houdini. And uh, they actually fell in love during the filming and ended up married. So uh, it was kind of, that's a cool part of the story. But when the movie premiered in Chicago, uh, the producers of the film wanted Tony Curtis and Janet to be there in person to introduce the movie, and they wanted them to perform one of the illusions that was in the film. Uh, among them was Houdini's Metamorphosis. It's a trunk exchange that we do in our Christmas version of the show, where he's inside the trunk, she's outside, the cloth goes up, and they've switched places. Uh, the prop department did not want to send the trunk to Chicago because it was actually on loan from Houdini's brother. The trunk that was in the movie was Houdini's, and they weren't going to risk sending it to Chicago. So they called a magic shop in Chicago and asked if anyone had a trunk similar, and Jack Gwynn uh, had one. So Tony Curtis asked Jack if they could borrow the trunk, if they'd, they'd rent it from him. And they, he said, you can't rent it, I would be honored. He brought it to the theater. So for one very special moment, Tony Curtis and Janet Lee were both in this trunk, but not at the same time. <laughs> A magician that's not real well known in the public's memory, but very respected among the magic fraternity, his name was Nicola. He traveled the world and presented magic from around the world. When he would float the lady in the air, the theme was like India, very mysterious. And the woman wore genie shoes, and these are the slippers that she wore. Uh, and in the uh, lithograph picture behind, you can see the, the curled genie shoes that she wore. Uh, as the story goes, he would tell the audience that whoever wore the magic slippers would float in the air. And of course, everybody thought that was cool. But I was in an antique shop in my hometown, and I asked the guy, I said, is there anything here related to magic or magicians? And he said, yes, I have a magic wand that belonged to Nicola. Well, he had no documentation, no provenance, as they call no letter documenting or any proof. Mm -hmm. But he said, I swear to you, it belonged to Nicola. And I had to believe him because if he was wanting to take me, he'd have said it belonged to Houdini or some mm -hmm. name that people would recognize. Right. So uh, I bought it, sat on the shelf for years. When I moved the collection here to Tennessee, uh, when we're unwrapping everything, the cap on the end of the wand had broken off, or I thought. I had it for years and didn't know it actually unscrews. It's a hollow tube. Inside the tube, rolled up so tight, almost like the thickness of a cigarette, was a scroll. That's a copy of it on the back wall. It's an appreciation letter from a magic club in India telling Nicola how, in their opinion, they think he was the greatest magician who's ever lived. Oh my 1930s. That's so not only did it prove that it was Nicola's, but I felt like Indiana Jones. I started yeah. going through every box, every paper, <laughs> every book. Um, but that was a really cool find. That's an incredible. That's amazing. One. I'd referenced Jack Gwynn earlier. Jack Gwynn was from Chicago, and he's the one that had the trunk that he uh, loaned for the Houdini premiere. Uh, he was one of the few magicians who actually looked like a magician, the sinister magician of the 1920s with the little beard and the curled mustache. A uh, very mysterious man, very well respected among magicians. Jack Gwynn had heard a rumor of an illusion called the Sands of Egypt, where three colored sands are taken and mixed under black water. The audience calls out one of the colors. Jack would roll back his sleeve, show his hands empty, and reach inside under the water and pull out the sand color that had been requested and pour it back completely dry from under the water. So he went to Egypt and he discovered the secret, brought it back to America, along with all the costumes, even this backdrop was actually the table cover that he used during his presentation. We have the original backdrops in our Christmas show and I recreate uh, Jack Gwynn's presentation of the sand trick as the three gifts of Christmas. So it's kind of a, uh, a story in the Christmas show 
but I think it's cool because it has a special memory and history for me. These are the original bowls, towels, and sands that Jack used during his presentation of an illusion that he traveled halfway around the globe to, to bring back the secret to America. Really cool magician and an awesome effect that we perform in our Christmas show every year. Well, in my opinion, no one created more magic than Walt Disney. I mean, no one would debate that. If magicians have performed for centuries, and no one has created the magic that Walt did. And luckily for me, several of the Mickey shorts, uh, the cartoons that he did, and themes for movies and the rides were based on magic. So this is a collection of specifically Magic Mickey, not just Mickey, but Magician Mickey. Uh, statues, books, uh, cartoons, just all kinds of memories of his. But the coolest part to me is in the center of the display, there's a large magician statue. When Walt created Disneyland along Main Street, there are many shops and uh, nostalgic things, including a magic shop. He loved magic tricks. So uh, the first, uh, demonstrator behind the counter. You'd go into the magic shop to learn a magic trick to purchase. And guess who the first demonstrator was? Hmm. A wild and crazy guy. Was that you? you? No, not me. <laughs> Do you know who that is? Oh. Steve Martin. No way. Steve Martin, the comedian. He was, his first job in entertainment was as the magician at Walt Disney's magic That's shop. Awesome. But in the window of the magic shop was a statue of a magician with the rabbit in the top hat. And this is it. This is the original statue that was for years in the magic shop window at Disney Land. So uh, I have no doubt what you're looking at here, Walt Disney had his eyes on. Oh, that is lovely. amazing. That's incredible. All right, so I have one last question. All right, Lexi, bring it on. Um, I'm ready. How do you do all of your tricks? <laughs> you can't ask a magician that. No, that I is am. the word. Here's the problem. Once you know the secret, the magic is gone. It's really more fun not to know. You know, I, I, I try to explain that to the audiences every night. But if you you, you really want to know, yes, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Can you keep a secret? Definitely. I mean, I can. No. Promise. I promise. Pinky promise. Pinky promise. You can keep a secret? Yes. Because guess what? What? So can I. Oh, oh, where do you what? <laughs> that was awesome. I guess, um, I guess we're not going to get to learn the rest of his tricks, are guess we? I shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> you can keep a secret. Yes. Guess what? What? So can I. Okay, go. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I All love right. that. That was so cool. <laughs>